Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the, uh, this event to announce the results of the 2008 Timpani Toys Study. Uh, I'm Julia DeLapp and I'm the director of the Center for Early Childhood Education here at Eastern Connecticut State University. And today we'll be discussing the most recent iteration of a study that we've been conducting for the past nine years. We do the Timpani uh, Toy Study every year to better understand how toys influence children's cognitive development, their social interactions, their language development, and their creativity. And then we share those results uh, to help families and teachers consider how toys help their children learn, and also to influence future research um, on children's play. Um, so I'd like to make a few introductions before I hand things over to the president. Um, first, I want to acknowledge the four students who worked on the study this year. We believe deeply in engaging undergraduate students in meaningful research and professional experiences. It's really a critical component of a liberal arts education. By spending hours and hours uh, recording and then watching and re-watching footage of teachers and children, our students learn how to apply all the things that they've read and that they've heard about in their classes. And working on these studies helps make them employable. Um, principals and superintendents and graduate schools value the collaboration, the critical thinking, and the communication skills that our students get as they conduct this research and then as they present those findings in a variety of contexts. <clears throat> um, there were four undergraduate res researchers who were involved in the study this year. And so first I'd like to introduce Allison Lundy. She's over here. <laughs> Allison is a junior. She's studying early childhood education and psychology, and she started with us as a sophomore working on the 2018 study, and she'll be, she's continuing with us right now working on the 2019 study. And also this spring, she'll be conducting her own study for her honors thesis. Um, she presented along with Morgan Winship and Dominique McLean at the National Association for the Education of Young Children Conference in Washington, D.C. just a couple of weeks ago. This is a huge professional conference and they presented to other researchers, included people with doctorates, and they did an amazing job. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Dominique and Morgan couldn't be here today because they are student teaching right now. Um, and they are due to finish that in just a week or two and they will be graduating and moving on into the workforce. And then the fourth student who worked on this study, Nicole Green, um, I'm happy to report that she can't be here either because she is pursuing a doctorate right now at the University of Florida. Um, so our students do, do go on and they get jobs and they get into graduate school. <laughs> um, the other people that I want to acknowledge and introduce and thank are um, those at the Child and Family Development Resource Center. We could not conduct this study without the cooperation of all of the preschool teachers and Nilafar, the director, for doing this. So we do have Claudia in the back and Nilafar and Claudia, thank you so much for being part of this. Um, and then lastly, I want to thank our administration for their ongoing support of this research. Um, they make it possible not only for our students to conduct the research, but also to travel to present the results at national conferences, which is just an incredible opportunity for students that they would not get at other kinds of institutions. So biggest thank you to our number one champion, uh, Dr. Elsa Nunez, the president of the university. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome her up here. This event is an important event in my life because after I hear what toy won, I can go out and buy it. And I understand then that Christmas is here and I have to do all the shopping for all of the relatives. Thank you for being here today as we announce the results of the ninth annual Timpani Toy Study. I can't believe it's nine years. I remember the very first time that we gathered here um, and began the, uh, the toy study uh, announcement. But what's wonderful about it is to see where we've ended up. Uh, Julia just told you that the emphasis is on undergraduate research and the emphasis is on helping students accomplish what they want to accomplish as young scholars uh, professionally, whether it's a job at the end of the day or graduate school. It is remarkable how far the uh, 
timpani's toy, toy study has taken our students. When we started, my two grandsons were young enough that the timpani toys were great Christmas gifts for me to get them. Today, they're both teenagers, so they don't really work. However, I have, they have three cousins, my daughter's three preschool daughters, who love the kinds of toys that we continue to see winning the timpani toy award each year. So today's announcement, as I said, is an exciting day for me as president of Eastern Connecticut State University and as a grandmother. The holiday season is a great time for young children, but it's a challenging time for parents and grandparents. There are so many toys on the market, some of them being advertised heavily on television and online, and parents are faced with the choice day in and day out, what toy will inspire my child's creativity? What toys are educational? What toys fo foster a child's social skills? The Timpani Toy Study has developed a well-earned reputation for answering those questions over the past nine years and has become an Eastern tradition in the process. As you know, the announcement goes viral and it goes international. It's amazing how many um, scholars, teachers, parents actually read about the toy study and purchase the toy that we recommend. Timpani is an example of groundbreaking empirical and thought-provoking student research on our campus. It's very sophisticated. It is mentored by expert faculty. The assessment tool used is scientific and criteria-based, so the results are empirically grounded. And that's really important that it's not just a popularity contest of what toy the students like best or the children like best. Not many undergraduate students in this nation get to conduct criteria-based behavioral research, but it is helping and uh, it is happening right on this campus. And our students don't just participate in the research, they actually create the research themselves. This past month, as they have each year, the timpani study has been in existence. Our student researchers presented their findings, as Julia said, at the National Association for Education of Young Children. How many undergraduates can put that on their resume that they're graduating and have done pre presented at a professional conference in a scholarly way. This year's timpani results are interesting as usual, but I'm not going to reveal them in advance. Of course, I'm not allowed to do that. But I will tell you each year the winning toy, and this year's no exception, has been unique, different, yet all have given children the freedom to explore their imaginations, which is critical, and to grow. Preschool teachers, parents, and others across the globe use this study to help select toys for their children and promote intellectual growth, social interaction, and creativity. We are reminded this year, as always, of the importance of play in a child's development and the critical role that toys serve in a child's playtime. In fact, for the first time, the researchers have examined how toys are introduced in the classroom by teachers, and that impacts children's play. In the process of conducting this study each year, we have been able to give our early childhood education students an opportunity to conduct empirical research, as I said, under the tutelage of early childhood education professor and endowed chair, Jeffrey Twaywick smith Jeffrey retired earlier this year, and I cried. I thought he would never come back to help us with this study, but I was wrong. He, was still, he is still actively involved, and this year he really enjoyed working with the students and, of course, with the toys. And we are delighted he is still sharing his wisdom and knowledge with our students. Jeff, we are so happy that you're still engaged, and we are so thrilled that you're back and, and wouldn't give this up. Even if we don't pay him, he's still inv involved. In addition to Jeff, I want to congratulate our students. You, you heard their names and you see their faces on the screen. Nicole Green, Dominique McLean, Allison Lundy, Morgan Winship, and April Doolin. We are very proud of all that you have accomplished. Allison, we're really happy that you're here this morning to hear <laughs> us sing your praises. All these students are to be commended for their painstaking data collection and analysis as well as their commitment to young children. But I also want to thank the mover and the shaker, the person who anchors this initiative, and the force behind it, Julia DeLack. She and other staff in the Center for Early Childhood Education work so tirelessly to help the faculty and the students optimize the research setting. And they also work very hard to make sure that each year the study is done completely, ethically, and with the uh, principles that we think are so important for undergraduate research. Julia, we thank you for your leadership. 
with professionals like Jeff and Julia, we've been able to share the knowledge they and our students gain with early childhood professionals throughout the region. And there's a series of um, video clips on the web page. If you ever go there, you should go there, you'll see how people are able to learn about early childhood education, the aspects of early childhood education, and play in particular. Before I pass the podium over to Dr. Trawick Smith to announce this year's winning toy, I want to encourage everybody from the media and our guests here today to go to the Child and Family Development Resource Center right after the presentation and you'll see the children playing with the toys. That's really what makes it uh, important to see how they interact with the toys. Again, thank you for coming. Jeff, why don't you come to the podium and join us and reveal what toy has won. Thank you. Um, I did want to tell you one more thing before Jeff uh, starts talking, um, which is that there's something new with this year's study. Um, every year, every time a toy comes into a classroom, the teachers introduce it in some way. So they have to do some kind of explanation and tell children what is coming into their classroom. And over the years, our students have noticed that every teacher has his or her own unique way of introducing the toys. So we got very curious about this and wondered if those introduction styles had any influence on the toy that we observed, uh, on, the, on the play that we observed with those particular toys. So for the past couple of years, we have been looking more closely at how teachers introduce those new materials when they come into the classroom. We don't have results yet because research is a long process, um, so we're still looking at it this year and we hope to have those results uh, next year. But because we're doing it, it influenced the toy selection this year. And we needed to really isolate the effect of those introductions. We needed to look at toys that had similar characteristics. So this year, we chose eight construction toys for the study. And Jeff is going to tell you a little bit more about that. So I always like getting up and sharing my thoughts about the Timpani toy study. I get off on tangents. Julia was wise to fit that in before I started talking. Did you notice? Before Jeff starts talking, get in all the comments you can. I'm, I'm going to try to really be brief. Um, I, I did want to, uh, I, I was struck by the uh, toy that scored highest this year, and it inspired some thinking about uh, a paradox of toys and play, and I just want to share for just a couple of minutes what I mean by that. Um, first of all, on the one hand, play is really complicated. It's a really complicated process. A year or two ago, I shared some brain research that suggests when children play, their brains are just lit up. Uh, I, I claim more than when they're being read to. Um, and so uh, it, it's just uh, you know developmentally so complex. Uh, but over the decades, over the centuries, really, uh, you know, th theorists, philosophers, uh, scholars of different kinds have recognized this, and I thought I'd just give a few examples. Um, there's a quote from Francis Quarles. I don't know if you've read him. He's a poet, a 17th century poet, and he says, Judge not the play before the play is done, for her path hath many changes on every moment. Um, I, I find it interesting he's assigned gender to play, but that's for another day, another discussion for another day. Then there's, uh, and uh, 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 he really actually has uh, had a great influence on, on my thinking. Brian Sutton Smith, who's an anthropologist, says, play is ambiguous and includes as many activities and states of mind as religion, war, or politics. It can go in as many different directions as there are unique individuals in the world who are playing. But my favorite quote by far about the complexity of play comes from an undergraduate student researcher who worked on timpani a few years ago. That I, I'm not going to name her, though many of us here know, know and love her well. Uh, and that is, play is way too complicated. What are we even doing here? Actually, Allison, you probably are muttering this as you're sitting up in our research office trying to figure out uh, this complex behavior. So on the one hand, you have this incredibly complex, important behavior. And by the way, I should mention the complexity of play is important. That makes it a much more developmentally useful uh, experience. But on the other hand, it seems, and this has been verified over our years with Timpani, but especially this year, I think, 
that often it's the simpler toys that lead to the complex play. So in other words, simple toys lead to complex play. So I thought I'd just share a couple of examples of this and then uh, tie this to our, our findings today. Um, first off, I want to share that the Strong Museum of Play uh, it has a toy hall of fame and a couple of years ago they inducted the stick as a, uh, a toy of the year uh, for their museum. A stick. Um, and if you think about it, if, as you were growing up uh, out in the woods or in the yard, uh, they, they make terrific toys uh, and all kinds of complex things could be done with them. Um, if you want to see more of this, go to some of the Finnish uh, forest schools. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit a, one of these schools, a preschool uh, in, uh, outside of Helsinki, and the kids just go out and play. I mean, they go out, you know, four and five year olds, and by the way, they do that in the winter, uh, and Finnish winters are tough going. Uh, they may pack some books, but the toys are really the out of doors and the found objects. Um, you can see, for example, the little girl there, that's a stick <laughs> of a kind. Um, so it's another example of where you know, uh, at least uh, some teachers in Finland have discovered it's the simple things that children play with so in such elaborate ways. Uh, by the way, I just always like to point out that F Finnish children have among the highest literacy rates in the world. So, uh, you know, this must pay off. Um, and then there is uh, the work of Elizabeth Prescott. She didn't like using the word simple toy for, for example, the toy uh, that we're going to announce in a few minutes. She uh, said this, that toy complexity has to do with what children do with it, not the toy itself. Uh, and so, um, for example, she would think that this little pink telephone that's available at Target <laughs> for some outrageous amount of money um, is not a complex toy. It's a very simple toy, she would say, because although it's got lots of bells and whistles, lots of buttons, lots of flashy things, it only does a couple of things. Whereas uh, playing with blocks leads to infinite numbers of experiences and activities and interactions with peers. So the idea here is that she would, she would call complex toys those that have many, many different uses. Then that gets to uh, an ancient study, not really all that ancient, but 1990, this is a really long time ago, I did a study. Actually, I did it on the old Keeler Hall, which some of you may remember. It was a child development center on campus. I should point out before I share this that, so uh, a colleague of mine, Jeff Danforth, who's still in our uh, psychology department, I got a grant to put a little, a tiny little cheap camera in the library of this child development center. And then what we would do is stand in the closet to manipulate it, not together, we didn't go in together, but, and then we would bring children into this little room, which was also a library, and we could record children interacting. Um, so take in, keep in mind when I share this study that um, these children were interacting in a strange setting with strange materials and with these weird guys standing in the closet. So, um, you know, maybe not the most, uh, I don't know, authentic kind of behavior. Nonetheless, it was kind of interesting because what I did was I set up a, a center that had realistic, elaborate, mainly make-believe toys. And then I had junk, and I borrowed a lot of junk from the Boston Children's Museum. I don't know if they still do that, but they would sell junk <laughs> to, for teachers to use. And so I set up, it had a lot of cardboard boxes and so on. And just real quick, some of the findings kind of began to get me thinking about all this uh, in relation to what we're talking about today. For example, the number of make-believe themes for the realistic setting were things like, you know, typical things like making dinner, feeding the baby, and so on. These were perfectly great types of play, wonderful. But the boxes and the junk led to all these, which I can't, po this is just a sampling of the things that they did. I can't possibly read all these. Um, it's, this is intended more to go, wow, there are a lot of those. Uh, but, but it's quite, hu and some of them are quite humorous things you would, net, like making a spook house. Who would ever think that, you know, children would do that? Um, so the idea here is that it, there were way more complex things that were being done. 
Um, and then uh, just real quick to name a couple of other findings I found, now this was after age three, um, when children use these kind of non-realistic, kind of simple materials, they engaged in twice as many symbolic interactions. In other words, they used them objects in, uh, in symbolic ways. Three times as many social interactions, five times as much verbalization. And I think one of the reasons is when you play with junk, you know, when you play with something that has no obvious intended purpose, you have to talk to each other about what it is. You've got to negotiate. No, no, no. That's, I remember in the spook house play, one little girl was saying, this is a spider web. No, 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 no. That's not a spider web. We have to have you know, something. You know, and so you get into these elaborate discussions. So how does any of this have to do with timpani today? Um, I think more than any other study, although maybe some others too, uh, that we, uh, we have found this to be the case, this highest scoring toy is first and foremost really simple and non-detailed. It doesn't suggest any one play theme. Um, so much so that I think some of the teachers, some of the researchers kind of said, oh, really? That's the toy? Um, and, you know, almost like kind of surprised because of its lack of, you know, detail and elaborate uh, detail. Um, it could be transformed into anything. So, I mean, as you saw in my earlier study, it became all kinds of things. This toy could be infinite in its uses. Um, it required more, and this is a clear uh, finding from our study, it definitely required more negotiation, conversation. There was way more language with this toy. Um, it inspired children of all ethnic and socioeconomic status uh, groups. One thing I want to say about non-realistic materials like blocks or whatever, they tend to be somewhat culture neutral. So, you know, they tend to work well with children of all cultures because they can transform these into any family or culturally related theme they wish. And then finally, although we didn't study this, I always make the argument that these kinds of toys are great for children with disabilities. And the reason is you can't fail using these. It's not like a puzzle that you can't make because there are too many pieces or it's, uh, you know, the, any child of any ability level can use these and feel successful. Um, so um, those are some thoughts I have. Uh, I notice I didn't give this away because it's that time to unveil. Uh, and you've had a chance, maybe some of you, to see the toys that we studied. Oh, we do the video first. You know, you'd think I'd never done this before. How many, we did this nine times and I still am going, okay, what goes next? Sorry, Julia. Next year on. I will switch to the video. Um, and I do want to point out that this uh, video is available uh, due to the work of Ken Miesemer, our production coordinator, and his student, April Doolin, who is a communication student. So for thinking and learning, we were looking at if the child was curious, how engaged they were with the toy, what they would do to try to solve problems with the toy, decisions they would make while playing. How intricate the problems were, how intricate the decisions were, how they explored the toy, the comments that they made about the toy, if there was a new concept that was stated. The toy that scored highest on thinking and learning was Starflex. The Starflex are star-shaped, bendable pieces that have slits in the ends of each of them so they can connect together. Children were curious about that and trying to problem solve in order to put it together. It was very open-ended, so the children had to think of different ways to use it. At one point there was a race car and they drove it, they made a road for the race car. The child that made the race car needed to model how to make the race car to the other children. Starflex was the highest scoring toy among Caucasian children and among children from higher socioeconomic status. So for social interaction, we were looking for um, children working together, uh, playing together either cooperatively or like associative or parallel play whether um, they're engaging in solitary play or if they're engaging in more collaborative play with their peers. And we're also looking at the frequency of like interactions with their peers as well. Where's the I'm doing a big tower. And we're looking at how they're interacting, how positive and negative these interactions are. So the bottle click scored the highest in the social interaction area. 
Um, the bottle clicks were bottle shaped pieces that children can stack up or they can connect them side to side in a variety of different ways. Getting more longer, Matthew. You would see them working together trying to stack the bottle clicks as high as they could. That was a huge problem that they had, how they were going to get high enough in order to stack them because the bottle clicks were higher than them and there were times where they needed a lot of help and needed to interact with each other in order to stack the bottle clicks on such a high point. The bottle clicks also inspired some really interesting play narratives. Let's make the coolest guitar ever! Guitar, guitar. I think it scored highest in this category because the children were able to share them and kind of collaborate and kind of discuss what they were building with their peers as they were playing with it. Are you ready now? Say one, two, three, blast off! One, two, three, blast off! Bottle Clicks was also the highest scoring toy among Latino children. One, two, three, blast off! In the creativity and imagination subscale, we're looking for how creative the children are while they're playing with a toy. If they're using it in novel ways, if the children are transforming the toy into different things. Lay down. Lay down. Are you open now? Lay down. We were looking at how the children were able to express themselves through the toy. When they were able to connect it to something from their home life, we also looked at the narrative that they made through with the toys and how elaborate the narratives were. So Starflex scored the highest in creativity and imagination. It's open-ended, so the children had to really come up with ways to transform the object into something else. They kind of connected it in an intricate way that I thought was very outside the box and it was very imaginative. Interestingly, although the Starflex inspired really high quality play, it was one of the toys that was played with the least frequently. Children just didn't choose to play with it as often as other toys. You can make a bow with this. Hello? Bye. So with verbalization, we were looking at how often the child like, talks with the toy. Um, we're speaking about the toy, talking to others with the toy. If they're engaging in reciprocal conversations and the amount and intensity of what they're saying as they're playing with the toy. I made it! Good job, you made it any utterances the children make with the toy. It could be comments about the toy or it could just be noises that they make that are assisting them in a narrative. So blocks scored the highest for verbalization. They were colorful table blocks. They have like triangular prisms, squares, rectangles, cylinders, semicircles. Children would talk to one another about what they made or work together to try to add on to what they made. So that required like reciprocal conversations. Oh, you did not like a door. Well, uh, my house don't need a door. It says, you think that's the white end. They would kind of verbalize about the different shapes that they were seeing and kind of talk a lot with their peers as well as their teachers about what they're building. We're making a big one. We're making a big house so you can, so you can live. This is my mom. Okay. This is my mom. 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 Blocks inspired high quality play for children of both low, middle, and high socioeconomic status. All right, so I do have to say this. If you were trying to keep up with all that, all of these toys did pretty well. I don't know if you noticed, and I think the reason is because we kind of uh, limited this year's study to construction toys. They all have small pieces. I think they all meet that criteria of being uh, unrealistic, being simple, things that can be transformed. And you could see that really well on the video. But we have to select 
one toy, the highest scoring toy, and we did find that one kind of uh, outperformed others in our observation. And that toy is, you ready? Should we do, we should have drums, yeah. you know, or something, but yeah, play a drum roll. <laughs> but anyway, here we go. <laughs> anyway, uh, the uh, to high scoring toy this year were the bottle clicks, which, you know, it's pretty basic, right? I mean, so anyway. So thank you. Uh, should I, do you want to say a few things at the end here? Just um, so long. Yes, we can, oh. we can tell them more. Oh, okay, great. The I'll get out of the way. Which is that um, we did find out that sometime in the year after we began testing this toy and now, the manufacturer changed the name. <laughs> so if, if you go searching for bottle clicks, you won't find them. They are now called Mags Clicks. <laughs> Right. The name of the company is Mags, and they, they renamed them to Mags Clicks. So, <laughs> oh, Bottle Clicks is more descriptive of what they look like, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to thank everyone for coming here, and um, Jeff and Allison and I will be around if you have questions and you want to ask about the study. And then in a little bit, the children will be transitioning from outside back into their classrooms, and you can get into the classrooms to take pictures and video of children playing with the toys. So thank you again. Thank you.